is it safe to come out yet? I know we've lost a few games, guys, but it, is it safe to come out from underneath the bunker yet? Hello, everyone, and once again, welcome to What's Happening, your weekly Eyes on the Prize recap video series with me, your host, Scott Matla. And as you can tell from my opening reaction, things have not exactly gone to plan to start the season in Montreal. Getting right into things here, um, season kicked off this past week. I'm sorry this video is a little bit delayed, but work and everything has been absolutely crazy. Obviously with the season in swing, Eyes on the Prize has several things that take precedence over my ability to always make a video. Work's getting crazy hours and I've got a vacation coming up, but I'll get to that at the end of the video for right now. But starting the season in Buffalo against the new look Buffalo Sabres and the Canadians came away with a 3-2 shootout victory in what was actually a highly entertaining game, which is a drastic departure from anything that's happened in Buffalo in the past five or six years against that team. Um, Canadians faced a little bit of adversity, still came back, found a way to win, and Jonathan Drouin had his height meter, like if we're down over here and it's absolute failure and it goes flying to the other end and better than Gretzky, he broke the meter in the first game. Like the arrow went shooting off like a cartoon and hit some old person in the first row and now everyone's upset and yada yada yada. But way the game went, Canadians faced adversity, went down on two or two separate occasions. Um, Max Patrick and Jonathan Duran connected on an absolutely gorgeous passing play. Blast the puck past Robin Leonard. Game's tied. Go back again. Shorthanded after Andrew Shaw got called for interference on a play where in which he was run into by a Buffalo player. He's sitting in the box, so Philip Deneau does what Philip Deneau does. He gets in, heavy on the forecheck, steals the puck, slides it past Leonard. Robin Leonard throws a mini temper tantrum in his crease. Canadians go on into the shootout where Jonathan Drouin, in his first real high-pressure situation, made Robin Leonard look like me playing street hockey where you're just flailing around and hoping to God it hits you and stays out of the net. Well, I don't know what else to say. It, it was filthy. If you haven't seen the clip, go watch it. It's absolutely disgusting. It like I just sat there and I just watched it on a loop over and over again. So I'm like, oh my god. His hands are like the equivalent of like Jesus and something equivalent to that. I don't really know what to go with here because it's a very bad, bad metaphor. So after that, Canadians put up a lot of shots. Carey Price played well, keeping Buffalo Bay going into Washington, where a lot of people expected not, you know, the same level of ease. But things didn't go to plan. 30 seconds into the game and the Canadians are down 2-0. Three minutes in the game, they're down 3 nothing, and it never really got close after that. Alexander Ovechkin single-handedly destroyed the Montreal Canadiens on Saturday night. He scored four goals and looked bored doing it, which is kind of terrifying. Given that he got denied the ability to go play in the Olympics, the popular thought is he's just going to destroy every team in the NHL until they go, no, no, please, please go and save our teams some, you know, dignity here. Um, also in that game, the probably the most, or one of the coolest things that I've seen so far is Nathan Walker is the first Australian hockey player, or um, Australian hockey player to play in the NHL. And of course, in this first game, he scored a goal that deflected off of him and into the net that made it, I believe, 5-1 or 6-1 Washington, becoming not only the first Australian to play in the NHL, but the first Australian to score a goal. And his parents' reaction was absolutely priceless. His fiance and everyone jumping up and down the crowd, screaming, waving the Australian flag. It's a moment that even in a game where the Canadians were absolutely destroyed, I can't help but feel a little bit of joy about that. It's something special. And I know everyone's like, oh, everyone scores their first goal against the Canadians. This wasn't just a first goal. This was a first goal for an entire nation in the NHL. So it sucks. They lost. But the thing is, they also played well in that game. In the second period, Montreal took it to Washington for 90% of the period. It's just in the 10% that they didn't, the Capitals scored two more goals. So I, I don't know. Carey Price got pulled after the first after allowing four goals. Al Montoya played the rest of the game. He did his best, but some nights it's it's just not there for you. There's really nothing you can do about it. And then the following night, they would actually play the Rangers. Instead of Price getting the day off, like we originally thought, and playing against Andre Pavlik, who was supposed to start for the Rangers, who actually played for them on Saturday when they lost 8-5 to the Leafs, which 8-5 oh, isn't a good look when your starting goalie gave up five of them. So... 
So going into Sunday, um, I know it's Canadian Thanksgiving weekend. I know it's Indigenous Peoples Day in the U.S. this week as well. Um, they played the Rangers at Madison Square Garden in their last game of the road trip before they return home to play Chicago on Tuesday in the Montreal home opener. And what we got was a frustrating mess of a game. The Canadians had two goals disallowed in the first period. I didn't have a chance to see the first period. I was still at work. I had family over for dinner, etc., etc. So I missed the two disallowed goals. And Captain Max Pacioretty isn't using that as an excuse for why they ended up losing that game. What happened was there were a couple mental breakdowns later in the game. Mika Zibinejad got the puck off a of Jeff Petrie turnover. And he's a very good hockey player. And very good hockey players take advantage of bad hockey plays. He turned a bad turnover into a 1-0 goal, and that would really be all the Rangers needed for the game. It's disappointing, and it's frustrating, and I get it. It reminds everyone of last year's playoffs where the team plays well. They get shots. They get high-danger chances. Loose pucks are in the net, and Lundqvist is just like... <laughs> That's my goaltending impression. Totally legit, I promise you. But he was stopping everything. It's frustrating. And I understand the frustration after last season. The positives that are coming out of these two games are the hype line, is which is what I'm calling Charles Houdon, Arturi Lekinen, and Tomas Plakanets, are absolutely dominating teams at even strength and in all situations. In all three of the games so far, a member of that line has led the team in possession in basic possession statistics, Corsi for and Corsi against. And it's not really close. Houdon had an 88% one against Washington. And then I believe it was Lekkinen who led the team last night with Houdon not far behind. The minute the PDO, which, you know, basically luck, you know, saves, goals going in, stuff like that. Once the PDO kind of levels out again, because they're sitting well below what it should be, that line is going to have goals flying in so quickly that the guy doing the score sheet is going to be like, yes, they scored a get, they scored a get, they got and they're just going to throw it out and just be like, yes, they scored 12 goals. I don't care anymore. I'm done writing down assists. So it's not all bad. The Canadians are 1-2, and two, and they could very easily just be 2-1 and one right now. Don't press the panic button. It's been three games. I And, you know, it's understandable. Like, last season's playoffs were a bad way to go out. The offseason was frustrating. There was a lot of change, but... Pushing the panic button now and doing something drastic, probably not the right idea because panic moves usually don't pay off very well. The defense, not great. It's it's not that it's not great. It's not replacing what we lost currently. But it's like I said, it's been three games. Mark Strait against Washington. All I can ha all I have is that oh god, it was the fifth goal where the Canadians were dominating play. They had scored shorthanded, and they were making things happen. Mark Strait goes down to block a shot and then just kind of stays there, you know, sprawled out, waving his stick around, and the Capitals player just goes around and goes, oh, hi, bye, and then they scored again, and that is the lasting image I have from that game, is Mark Strait just on the ice flailing around trying to do his best to stop a puck that he had no chance at. He got replaced by Brandon Davidson last night. It was better. It was an upgrade. The third pairing is still a work in progress right now. David Schlemko isn't healthy yet, so we're not quite sure what the optimal lineup looks like. Honestly, before long, you could see Jake, uh, Jacob Jarabek coming up from Laval, who had a very good opening game, but we'll get to that shortly as well. Uh, Brett Lernout has had a strong start to the season. He had a very strong preseason. Noah Juleson might be injured right now, but there's always a chance that you could see him get some spot duty soon as well. Coaching staff seems to like him, and I can understand why. He's a very steady defender that would do well, I think, playing in those third-pairing minutes. He's a little bit of offense to him. He can move the puck, and he's responsible, and that's what the team is looking for. So, yeah, don't press the panic button. Everyone back away from the ledge. Don't light things on fire. Don't plan a parade. Don't cancel a parade unless you want to plan a parade, in which case, please invite me. I love parades, but... There's not a real reason to panic right now. It's just been three games. If they're playing like this 10, 12, 15 games in the season, then we got to kind of look at things and go, you know, maybe that's not working. May, 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 probably it's not working. We should probably fix that. But three games, no. Take your finger off the trigger. 
it's not the end of the world, folks. We went 10-0 and to start last year and lost in the first round of the playoffs. It doesn't matter how you start, it's how you finish, right? So, not the end of the world, Habs fans. What is good, though, is the Rocket, Le or the Laval Rocket, I'm sorry, I tried to mash the French version of it and the English version of it together, and you got that. I apologize, but um, the Laval Rocket kicked off their debut season this past weekend on Friday and Saturday, and they kicked the living crap out of the Belleville Senators. They scored nine goals in two days and only allowed two against. Charlie Lindgren goes 2-0 to start the weekend. He got a shutout on opening night in a 3-0 win where Nikita Sherbeck and Michael McCarron were absolutely dominant. Daniel Aldette gets the first goal in Rocket history. And the newly acquired Nick Delorier scored an empty net goal, so that's always good. And not only was that a very good way to kick it off, they did so in dominant fashion. They limited the amount of shots from Belleville against, including they have uh, very few good prospects that are playing in Belleville. Thomas Shabbat and Philip Shoplek, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, again, I'm an idiot, not be trying to offend anybody. They limited their shots against, Lingren stood tall and made it look easy, and the offense clicked in and took off. And much like the Canadians on their opening night, the next night against Belleville, they went down 2 0 early in the second period and then scored six straight unanswered goals. Peter Holland, Nikki Petty, um, and a whole mess of other people made their presence known in that game. Everyone that you wanted to see on the score sheet has been on there this weekend. Multiple players with multiple point efforts, including Jerebek, who has two assists in the one game he played. Holland has two goals. Sherbeck has multiple points. McCarron has multiple points. Lindgren has two wins, and perhaps what's most important after this weekend is Laval, after going down to nothing, just kept the pressure on, and they outshot Belleville. They outshot Belleville 46 to 19. That's insanity. For anyone who's followed the AHL as closely as I have the past few years, the teams have often struggled to generate offense on a regular basis. In games this weekend, the offense is quick, moving up the ice. Defensemen are carrying the puck up through the neutral zone. You have forwards who are circling back to find better lanes in, and there is speed. It's not slow, methodical play. It's not chipping it off the glass. People are carrying the puck. They're carrying it with authority into the zone and making things happen. That's what you want to see from your team. And, of course, the AHL wouldn't be complete. A few roster moves. Um, Zach Redmond, who was a defenseman that I really liked last year in St. John's, was traded to Buffalo slash Rochester for forward Nick Delorier. Delorier came in, scored an empty net goal in his first game, made an impact. Redmond's was lost in the shuffle, unfortunately. With the way Juleson developed and Jerebeck coming in and Victor Mete stepping up the way that he has, Redmond became expendable. They went, they got a solid AHL guy that they can use in Laval this year in Delorier, who was on waivers in Buffalo anyways. It's an AHL for AHL trade. They were signed right there. As of right now, they both have points on opening weekend. Everyone's happy. The other one was Kyle Bond came in from Chicago, and Andreas Martinson was traded to the Blackhawks affiliate Rockford. And it's it's an AHL trade. Bond doesn't is he's got some decent skill. He was the second highest scoring forward on a Rockford team last year, but. He doesn't have to play up the lineup this year. Martinson being a guy that was on the AHL NHL cusp would have had to play further up in the lineup because that's what his status demanded. Kyle Bond likely isn't going to leave the AHL. So Bond can play bottom six and it's not a bad idea. And so far it seems to be working out pretty well. The bottom six is actually scored and produced, which has been an issue in the past in the AHL. So that's good to see. Another trade everyone's happy in the end, right? And then finally, the last thing I've got to get to, which is actually one of the only questions I got for the weekly mail back, was uh, Vadim Shipachov is apparently very unhappy in Las Vegas. Montreal has been linked to Vadim Shipachov in the past before he signed with Vegas in the offseason. He's a center. He's a little bit older. But should Montreal pursue him? It's tough to say. It's not the worst idea in the world. He's a solid player. We don't know what he can do at the NHL level because Las Vegas buried him in the AHL without giving him a shot so they could play Pierre Edward Belmar and Thomas Nosek. I think this kind of confirms what a lot of us realized after the expansion draft is that George McPhee might not be a very good general manager. It's He's the guy who picked Alexi Emelin over, Tom, er, over Charles Houdon, which 
How'd that turn out? Em you traded Emlyn for a pick, and now he's benched somewhere else. You could have picked a very good young forward that would have helped your team immediately. I, I say help, like they're not already 2-0 right now, but that's not the point. As for Shipachov, if Montreal really wants him to play, to come in and be a center in Montreal, it's kind of confusing a little bit because they would say Druin is a center, Galchenyuk is a winger, but if we bring in this guy from another team, he can play center and we'll shift Druin back to the wing, we'll shift Deneau to a wing. I don't know where he fits right now. There are a lot of centers on this team, just not enough space for them, so guys are getting shifted to the wing. Like, Tori Mitchell might end up playing the wing because Jacques, uh, Jacob De La Rose is playing center. Every, Andrew Shaw can play center, you know. It's tough to see where he fits in the lineup. He would be a huge boost if they really do want to say, okay, we'll shift Drew into the wing and play Shipachov in the middle. It's a huge boost to the team. Um, what's it going to cost to acquire him is I have no idea. I don't know what his value is because he hasn't played any games. I can't gauge his value. He is 30 years old. He makes $4.5 million. He's waivers exempt. Not that Montreal is going to send him to the AHL or like that matters. But his value can anywhere be from a first round pick to prospects, picks, and a roster player. I don't know. Maybe he could be had for next to nothing. George McPhee doesn't seem all that bright so far this season, says the guy who's sitting in an office at his parents' house making a video where he's talking to a camera and yelling a little bit. But, you know, it's an interesting thought. I wouldn't be opposed to seeing it if there's a way to fit him in the lineup that makes sense that includes Drew and Angel Chenya being kept on the roster and played in a fashion that suits their style. Drew at center so far, I haven't minded, but it would be really nice if we could get a definitive answer on what is he. Is he a center or is he a winger? Is Galchenyuk a center or is he a winger? If Shipachov comes in, we're just kind of stirring that pot up again and wondering what everyone is. So that's it for me today. Um, as always, if you ever have any questions or suggestions, you can at me at Scott Matla on Twitter or at Habs EOTP on Twitter. Always happy for feedback. And as a note, I will be on vacation for the next week, so there will not be a video next week unless you want a video of me running around Disney being a child. Um, as always, go Habs go, and I'll see you guys in two weeks.